Saturday, everybody. We have a new show launching on our network. It's called She Makes Money Moves, and it's hosted by Glamour Editor-in-Chief Samantha Berry. It is all about money, like its name suggests, especially how money relates to women. And to go along with that theme, today's classic episode is our August 27th, 2014 episode on Hetty Green. She was one of the wealthiest women in the United States in her day, but her eccentric behavior and her reputation as a miser led her to being disparagingly called the Witch of Wall Street. Tune in for a peek at She Makes Money Moves at the end of today's episode. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And um, so there's that stereotype. We talked about it a little bit in our uh, math episode, in our episode about algebra, uh, about women lacking mathematical proclivity and not having much business sense. Uh, But uh, those stereotypes were completely obliterated by today's topic. And in the mid-1800s, before many people were talking about obliterating those stereotypes, uh, she was seen as a peer and an equal to many of Wall Street's, you know, heaviest-hitting financiers. And she really opened the door to the idea that women could succeed in finance. But despite her immense success and these really admirable accomplishments, it's kind of difficult to like Hetty Green, um, who is who we're talking about today. And as is often the case with people who are extremely driven or really gifted in one way or in one area, the areas outside of her uh, life that fell outside of like finance and building her fortune really often suffered. And that included her family, which is part of why it's kind of hard to like her. And we'll, we'll get to a specific incident as we go on, but she's sort of fascinating in that regard. She's one of those people that you can't help but be fascinated by, but there is a certain sort of like, uh, I don't know if revulsion is the right word, but there's a, you can't help but wince a little bit at some of the things that happened in her life because of her obsession with building the family fortune. Uh, So we will kick it off and start just at the beginning, as we usually do, with her early childhood and her birth and her family. Hetty was born Henrietta Howland Robinson on November 21st, 1834 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Her mother was Abby Howland, who could trace her family directly back to the Mayflower, and her father was Edward Mott Robinson. And Hetty's mother is uh, said to have been quite dismayed that she did not have a son to be an heir to the family fortune. Uh, And so she also sent Hetty to live with her grandfather when she was still a very small child, in in part because Abby was in very poor health. So Hetty was not terribly close to her mother. Uh, As a result, Hetty spent most of her childhood with the men in the family, and she learned about business and money management from her father and her grandfather. The two of them were partners in a whaling company, which did quite well. Her father was an excellent and astute businessman who's said to have increased the family's fiscal fortunes 20-fold. And uh, right out of the gate, Hetty was really into money uh, as a concept. She opened her first savings account when she was only eight years old. Uh, And two years after that, she was sent to boarding school, although she wasn't terribly interested in it. She talks in interviews about how she um, kind of like went ahead and like trudged through, but she didn't really like it. Uh, And soon she was really uh, back with her male elders, reading the financial pages at home and feeling like she was getting a much better education in that regard. One of the stories about her is that her father set her up with a whole new expensive wardrobe for her formal society presentation, but she sold all of her new clothes and instead invested the money. And Hetty's mother passed away when when the heiress, Hetty, was only 25, and her newly single father decided to move to New York from Connecticut, and Hetty followed, because, you know, at this point in his life, even though he was a little bit older, he was still considered an eligible bachelor as a widower. Uh, and there's some pretty significant speculation that Hetty's motivation for following her father was to ensure that she was not forgotten and left out of the family fortune in the event that he remarried and started a new family. When her father and her aunt both died in the same year, Hetty, who was 31 at the time, was poised to inherit the family fortune. 
The general opinion of her male relatives was that she would have been better off with her money in a trust and uh, with a male relative managing things. And all of that had been arranged for in the wills, uh, for both of the wills in question. Yeah, she actually was not given as much in her aunt's will as she had hoped. Uh, And that comes up a little bit more in just a bit. But as a woman, you know, in the mid-1800s, even though she had grown up with these two men who were really quite established financiers and quite good at handling money and they had talked with her a great deal about it, she was still perceived as just being unable to handle the demands of managing any sort of wealth. Uh, But Hetty was very headstrong. She was very confident in her abilities to handle her own fortune. You know, she'd been keeping accounts for her father and she had been reading stock quotes to her grandfather every night from the paper since she was a very young child. And so she mounted a lawsuit against the trustees of her father's will and she actually took legal action to break her aunt's will uh, which was a newer version than the one she said she had last seen. She did manage to wrangle a million dollars of her father's fortune in 1865. And later on, she procured part of her aunt's estate. Eventually, after much arguing and litigation, uh, she reached an income arrangement from a trust. And she ended up with somewhere between $6 million and $7 million between the two estates. Uh, That's not adjusted to today's value, though. That is 1860s dollars. So it was a really, really huge fortune. Yeah, she she had plenty of money. I mean, uh, it's one of those things where even, you know, today, obviously, if someone had $6 million, they would be in pretty good shape. So you can imagine... Uh, 150 years ago, what that was like. Uh, And as all of this legal back and forth over her inheritance was dragging on, particularly the the, uh, stuff with her aunt's will, Hetty actually got married. She married Edward Henry Green, uh, and this was in 1867, and Hetty was 33 at the time. Uh, Green was a silk trader, and he served on the board of a bank, but his business and Hetty's did not mingle. The pair never combined their finances, which, as you can imagine, was pretty unheard of at the time. And in fact, Green had to sign a prenup agreeing that he would keep his hands off Hetty's money, which prenup arrangements of some sort or another have actually been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. But in my mind, this sticks out as one of the earliest sort of modern uh, prenup arrangements. Uh, For a while, the two of them moved to England and they stayed there for seven years. And this was a move that they made to escape some of the bad press that Hetty had gotten while she was contesting her aunt's will. She had a previous version of the will that had named her as the sole inheritor, and there was the scandal over the fact that people sort of believed it was a forged document that Hetty had made for herself. Yeah, and this, you know, caused also some legal heat, which helped move them right along to... uh... England, and they actually had their first child while they were living in London. His name was Edward Howland Robinson Green, and that was in 1868, so just a year after their marriage. Uh, And then three years later, still in London, they had a daughter named Hetty Sylvia Ann Howland Robinson Green, and she went by Sylvia as she grew up. The two of them and their children lived very well while they were in London, and all of their living expenses came out of Edward's money. So there had been a financial panic in 1873, and not long after that, just a couple years later, the Greens moved back to the U.S. Uh, you know, the the concerns had died down over the legal document and whether there had been uh, any foul play involved. And so they settled in Vermont, where Edward was originally from. And it was not long before Hetty marched right to Wall Street. She made a pilgrimage to New York, and she uh, went into John J. Cisco and Sons to deposit cash and stock certificates, and she was ready to start investing with that money right then. Uh, and with her separate and independent fortune, Hetty invested very, very wisely. Instead of focusing on fast cash investments that would build up her fortune really quickly, Hetty opted for long-term investments. She primarily invested in bonds and real estate. She also invested in the railroads, and she bought real estate primarily in Chicago, New York, and St. Louis. As her fortune grew, she also expanded her holdings well beyond these cities. And all of her uh, money handling, every move she made was really well informed. She did copious amounts of research on her own before she put her money behind anything. And it wasn't just that she was a patient investor. She was also really frugal. 
even though she had at this point had amassed a massive fortune, she lived really simply. She didn't have a lavish lifestyle at all. And as a consequence, she always had money. And when there were dips in the market or panics, she really didn't have to worry about it. She could just expand her fortune further instead of worrying about getting by day to day until the crisis passed. She loaned money and purchased real estate on the cheap from desperate sellers. And when the financial panics caused many investment firms to declare bankruptcy because of their huge debt, Hetty, who had never borrowed money as a rule, always stayed on solid ground. And before we get to kind of her uh, obsession with investing in money and expanding her wealth, uh, kind of ramping up, do you want to take a word from our sponsor? Sure. And so now back to Hetty. Uh, So (laughs) she is at this point in New York. She has really... uh, entrenched herself in this lifestyle of uh, trading and buying. And it seems as though uh, as her money management continued to take off and it took up more and more of her time, she grew less and less interested in taking care of herself. Uh, She seemed to just become so obsessed with her work and finance that everything else kind of fell away from her focus. Uh, Her clothes would go unwashed. They would eventually fall into ragged disrepair and she would continue to wear them. She often looked very grubby, uh, so much so that merchants are said to have winced when she entered their stores. They dreaded her dirty hands touching their merchandise. Uh, I mean, she would even purchase broken cookies at the the store so she could get a discount for them. And she would return berry boxes to the market so she could get a refund on them. So she was living very frugally, very, very cheaply, but she really wasn't taking great care of herself. When she finally did relent and take her clothes to the cleaners, Uh, She's said to have insisted that they only wash the bottoms of the skirts, so just to take away the obvious mud and dirt. Uh, And she would negotiate a reduced price for the partial cleaning. And her children, this is the part that really breaks my heart. Uh, You know, her children had the wealthiest woman in America for a mother, but they wore hand-me-downs. They looked like, you know, ragamuffins and poppers from like a Dickens novel. Uh, it's said that as their winter clothes wore thin, she would line them with newspapers rather than spend money on new coats. And shoes would get the same treatment. So if the kids had holes in their soles, she would patch them cheaply or just line them with paper uh, to, so that the hole wasn't completely open. Her tight-fistedness with her money really cost her son dearly. dearly. So when Ned, as he was known, hurt his leg while he was sledding, Hetty put off getting a medical treatment for him because she didn't want to get a bill from the doctor. And consequently, his leg never healed correctly, and it finally had to be amputated because he developed gangrene. So the nickname The Witch of Wall Street came from the way Hetty carried herself in public. As a woman, she was often confronted with people who thought that they could take advantage of her. And one of the ways that she dealt with that was by being really shrewd and abrupt in her behavior. She was very direct and very cautious in all of her dealings. And additionally, she wore solid black most of the time. Uh, and she wore uh, wore clothes that were a little bit outdated. Again, she didn't like to buy new clothes. So she would kind of be out of season in these older, you know, dusty looking things. So you could see where people would start calling her a witch uh, based on, you know, sort of the depictions of witches at the time. And it's also said that she did not really have a great personal smell, uh, which is not really a huge leap of logic given accounts of her less than stellar hygiene. Because she was this enigmatic and unusual figure, lots of rumors circulated about her. One of these was that she was so miserly that she only had one dress. Uh, As we've already mentioned, she definitely did have a penny-pinching streak about her. Yeah, and there's a story in uh, a 2012 biography that was written about her. And the way the story goes is that she was carrying $200,000 in bonds on public transportation. And again, that is not adjusted. That is $200,000 in 1860s money. Or this may have been a little bit later, but... Uh, And when someone insinuated, like, hey, that's not really wise to carry that much uh, wealth on public transportation, she insisted that she could not afford to hire a private carriage, as they were suggesting, and that if they can, that's great for them, but she couldn't. 
just kind of funny. You know, it's like the person sitting there with a pile of money in their lap saying they can't afford a taxi. In another story, she lived with a hernia for years rather than going to the doctor to have it looked at. And she only went once the pain became really unbearable. And then she was infuriated that the surgery was going to cost $150. She only agreed to it because she was in so much pain. And allegedly, she then tried to get away without paying the bill to the doctor. Yeah, uh, there's another rumor that went around that she had a man's brain in a woman's body. And in all likelihood, that was not intended to be taken literally by, you know, a person who initially said it. It was one of those, you know, uh, just kind of offhanded comments. This tidbit kind of slid into the rumor mill and people believed it as though it were a real thing and not sort of just a commentary on her shrewdness and her acumen in business. And it just added to that witch mystique that, you know, she's a sort of almost Frankenstein character that has, you know, male thinking in a woman's body. There's also a tinge of sexism in the nickname. Clearly, a woman who could amass so much of a fortune and stand toe-to-toe with men when it came to making deals had to be a sorceress. <laughs> yeah, and her odd and unsettling demeanor really didn't help. Uh, the press picked up the name and they started using the Witch of Wall Street anytime they reported any financial news involving her. And she was really worth reporting about. So a lot of men on Wall Street and elsewhere were just really happy to be insulting about Hetty. And some of these same men were the ones appealing to her for loans and fiscal assistance when they ran into a crisis. This was the case throughout her life. She's said to have saved the city of New York on several occasions when the city's coffers ran dry, and she even wrote a check for $1.1 million dollars in the 1907 Knickerbocker crisis as part of the emergency bank bailout that was headed up by J.P. Morgan. Yeah, people would just say horrible things about her and kind of snicker behind her back, but boy, they were really happy to take her money when they needed it, uh, as is often the case. Uh, And so while Hetty was having these spectacular successes in finance, her husband, unfortunately, was not. Uh, He had been making investments through the years, just as his wife had, but he just did not have her skill at picking winners and really, like, you know, assembling a a cohesive portfolio that was all smart moves. And the $2 million that he had entered their marriage with had slowly dwindled down until it was mostly gone. Unsurprisingly, a husband who could not manage his own money was of no interest to Hetty, despite the fact that he was from a good uh, family and, by all accounts, was a kind and affable man. She'd already bailed him out several times, And once she had to pull all of her money out of the bank to avoid it being seized to cover his debts. And at that point, enough was enough. And so in 1881, after 14 years of marriage, she took the children and she moved to New York. She kept the desk in an office on Wall Street, incidentally in the bank where she moved her money after the incident with Edward's debt collectors caused her to leave her previous bank. She brought her lunch of oatmeal or a plain ham sandwich with her every day. And because she wasn't exactly enthusiastic about paying taxes on the property she owned, she and the children never had a consistent home. The three of them moved around a lot to dodge debt collectors, and they stayed in cheap flats over the years all over the city. They spent time in Hoboken, the Bowery, Harlem, and Brooklyn, anywhere that Hetty could find a deal on a cold water flat with a low weekly rate. She would use aliases at most of them, sometimes even registering under her dog's name. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a debate over what the actual name of her dog was. And it could just be that there were multiple dogs. Some will list him as Dewey. Some even list him as Money <laughs> being his name, which to me sounds a little urban legendy. y uh, And I think there's another name in the mix. But in any case, her dog uh, rented some flats for her. Ned, uh, her son, went to Fordham and he pursued a law degree. And Hetty had always had in mind that he was going to be the one that managed the family fortune after her. And so after he graduated, uh, she gave him a job managing some of her properties in Chicago. And he did quite well there. And so she eventually moved him to Texas to see after interests there. His life away from his mother gave Ned a little taste of freedom. He started to like more extravagant living and he did have several dalliances with some ladies. We can say they had negotiable affections. (laughs) That's a perfect way to put it. (laughs) 
Hetty was afraid that he would end up married to a woman who was only after the family fortune, so she begged Ned to promise her he would never get married. He acquiesced, although his mistress, who was a former prostitute, stayed with him, and the pair lived as though they were married to each other. Ned uh, was eventually moved back to New York by his mother to see after the business. And unlike his mother, who still insisted on living in cheap rental flats, he lived for a little while at the Waldorf Astoria, and then he and his mistress moved to adjoining townhouses near Central Park. And while Ned did not share his mother's taste in lodging or lifestyle, he really did inherit her business acumen, and he proved himself to be extremely adept at managing the family fortune. Nettie and Edward's daughter, Sylvia, stayed unmarried and stayed with her mother until she was 39. At that point, she married Matthew Astor Wilkes, who was the great-grandchild of John Jacob Astor I. Wilkes was in his 60s, so he was much older than Sylvia, but Hetty approved of the marriage because he had family money of his own and promised that he would never touch Sylvia's. Yeah, it's said that Hetty didn't really like... uh... Matthew, but she liked that he was willing to stay out of her family's money. Uh, And Sylvia's wedding is often pointed to as one of the few times that Hetty kind of loosened her purse strings. She paid for the wedding, and it said, uh, and it said that she was much more fiscally indulgent in the whole affair than just about any other time she was in her life. And prior to Sylvia meeting Matthew, Hetty had also paid to host several dinners, uh, like places at the plaza, so that uh, her daughter could invite eligible men and they could have these sort of social events. Uh, And all of this was really because Hetty had been quite concerned that Sylvia wasn't married. And this sounds sort of a little ironic given what a fiercely independent woman Hetty herself was. But even so, she had been married and she seemed to think that it was important for a woman to marry at some point. Hetty died on July 3rd, 1916 at her son's townhouse. She had gotten sick several years before with pneumonia, and at that point, the papers had reported that the Witch of Wall Street was really at death's door, but she defied them and recovered. The illness left her pretty frail, though, and she wasn't able to work anymore afterward. So she moved in with her son and insisted that she pay him rent, but no more than she would have paid at the more modest lodgings she would normally have gotten for herself. And eventually, after falling into gradually poorer and poorer health, uh, she had had that that initial pneumonia that caused the death scare when she was in her late 70s. I believe she was 77. And then uh, as she was approaching her 82nd birthday, she had a series of paralytic strokes. And so she died just a few weeks before her birthday. When she died, she left behind a fortune of more than $100 million dollars which she'd acquired over the 51 years that she had worked. She owned about 6,000 pieces of property across 48 states, and she held the deeds to theaters, railroads, hotels, office buildings, and cemeteries, and she held the mortgages for more than 500 churches. Yeah, and again, that is not an adjusted amount. That was $100 million, uh, in the... 19 teens when she died. So I have seen various adjustment estimates that are wildly different. Some that put her in the low billions, uh, if that were today's money, and some that put her like in the tens of billions. So it's a pretty wide range. But basically, she would have been a billionaire if if this was uh, in today's uh, fiscal measuring. And so then uh, Ned inherited a big chunk of the money and unlike his mother, he took that money and he lived big. Uh, he was still, you know, doing his job as a, a financier, but he spent plenty of that money. He married his mistress that he had promised his mother he would never marry. Uh, although it is said that he also had dalliances with other women. Uh, and he spent a huge chunk of money building mammoth mansions in multiple places. And he staffed all of them with a full complement of servants. He kind of made up for all the lost time that they lived very poorly as children. And he gave a lot of money to charity, and he also funded several scientific research projects. He did some work with MIT and let them even use some of his property to to do some of their experiments. Ned died in 1937, and at that point, the estate went to Sylvia, who was already a widow. She, in turn, left the entire lot to various charities, so all that money that Hetty had spent her life hoarding eventually was given away. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's one of those moments where you're you feel reasonably confident that if she could, she was probably rolling in her grave. Uh, but it's interesting to note. I mean, uh, she gets these this almost caricature grade description in anything you read about her. That's why uh, I'm almost reluctant to ever say anything with certainty about her because it seems like every report of her is colored by sort of the press and this weird image that she had. But I want to wrap up with a quote uh, from Hetty herself that I think is really telling. And it it kind of uh, pulls the whole thing together and reminds us that, yes, she was a very extreme person with some very extreme behaviors, but she was still a person. And she uh, she said this in response to criticisms and bad press about her. Uh, and, you know, this is a woman who was listed in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's greatest miser. But this quote goes, My life is written down for me in Wall Street by people who, I assume, do not care to know one iota of the real Hetty Green. I am in earnest. Therefore, they picture me as heartless. I go my own way. I take no partner, risk nobody else's fortune. Therefore, I am Madam Ishmael, set against every man. So that's Hetty Green. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday. If you have heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of today's episode, since it is from the archive, that might be out of date now. You can email us at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. And you can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 